Um, you know, I, I'm convinced of one thing, and that is that Jesus is ready to come back. I believe that, I believe that God wants to prepare us, prepare our hearts to go to heaven. You know, I believe as we study the Bible and study different stories in the Bible, it is, has one goal, and that is to prepare us for Jesus' is coming. Do you believe that? I believe it is, and I believe God wants to speak to us this week. I believe he wants us to have a revival and a reformation in our own hearts. And so I believe if you let God speak to you that he will this week. Um, <clears throat> let's pray real quick. <clears throat> Lord, I'm so thankful, Father, for your mercy, Lord, and your grace that you've given to us, Lord. And um, Father, I... Um, don't feel worthy, Lord, to be able to present your word, Lord. But I know that you have a message, Father. I know that you want to teach us things. I know that you want to prepare us for heaven, Lord. And so I pray, Father, that you would um, speak to us this morning, speak to us this week, Lord, and allow a true revival to take place in our hearts. And Lord, that's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was watching a video on YouTube last week. It was a video on iPhone repairs, and I was watching this guy take this iPhone apart, and he had all these tiny little tools and had to pry it open very gently, and there was these tiny little screws that he had to use a tiny little screwdriver to, to get to. He had to unplug the battery to open it up, and all these little bitty screws, nuts and bolts. I don't even know if there's any nuts and bolts in the iPhone, but there was just all these little detailed things that gave this iPhone power. And I thought, that's really interesting. Because, you know, all we see is the iPhone. We just see it lit up, you know? And I thought, that iPhone would have no power. There would be nothing, nothing in that iPhone worth even looking at if it wasn't for those little bitty screws, those little bitty connections that hold that iPhone together. You know, I believe that is the Christian walk, friends. I believe there are little things that we can learn from the life of Elijah, that we can learn from different stories in the Bible. Little screws, little connections, little things, friends, that hold the Christian together and give the Christian power in his life, friends. And I believe that's what God wants to do. God wants to give us power, true power, true spiritual power. He wants us to light up more than that iPhone, friends. You know, as I was reading about the life of Elisha, um, the humble calling of this man, I um, saw some very beautiful lessons, some small things that seemed small, but some little things in the life of Elisha that held him together, that gave him power and gave him victory in his life, friends. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to look at the humble calling of Elisha. 1 Kings chapter 19. <clears throat> is everybody there? <clears throat> the humble calling of Elisha. You know, as I read this story, it was interesting because it was amongst national apostasy that God called Elisha. It was when the whole world had turned astray. The whole world, all of Israel had gone astray following the ways of the world. And look at what it says, though, in verses 18. When it seemed as if all Israel had gone astray, the whole world had gone astray, the Bible says in verse 18, God says, Yet have I left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. He says, Even when the whole world had turned from me, even when my own people had turned their back on me, God said, I have a faithful people. He says, I have a people, friends. And praise God that God always has a people, always has a faithful people on this earth, friends, that want to follow him. A people that want to put the Bible first, put God first, follow the Lord with all their hearts, surrendering their lives to Him. Praise God, friends, that God always has a people on this earth. And Elisha was one of these 7,000. He was one of those 7,000 that did not bow the knee to Baal. He was one of those 7,000 that put God first in his life, surrendered his whole life from a young age, friend. And we're going to read about Elisha right here, picking it up in verse 19. The Bible says, So he departed thence, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle on him. So as God called Elisha right here, what was Elisha doing, friends? Well, he was plowing, right? 
So this call came to Elisha when he was doing what? He was doing his daily duties. You know, there's some really some powerful things we can learn right here from the life of Elisha and from his calling. Because, friends, God is calling you. He's calling me. And, friends, he's calling us to take up the duty that lay nearest us and to be faithful in the small things. Elisha was plowing in the field. He was doing his daily duties. You could see it as if he was cleaning the toilet or he was washing the dishes. He was vacuuming up the dorm. Elisha was doing the duties of life, friends. You know, as I was reading this, I was thinking, um, what if Elisha would have called in for work that day? You know? What if he would have called in sick? He might have missed that call, friends. He might have missed his heavenly calling. God had a purpose for Elisha. And Elisha was doing those small duties in life, friends, just like God wants us to do. God wants us to be faithful in the small things of life, friends. I want to read a quote for you out of the book Education. And it's found on page 58. Education, page 58. Looking at the humble calling of Elisha here. <clears throat> Education, page 58, paragraph 3. The Bible says, For Elisha was the son of a wealthy farmer. Elisha had taken up the work that lay nearest. While possessing the capabilities of a leader among men, he received a training in life's common duties. In order to direct wisely, he must learn to obey. By faithfulness in little things, he was prepared for weightier, weightier trust. And that's really interesting, you know, because God is calling for leaders. You know, I believe that's what Washita Hills is, friends. It's a school for leaders. God is looking for leaders in this end time, friends. And it says, while possessing the capabilities of a leader among men, he was a leader by nature. Le leadership was in his blood, friends. But what does it say that he learned in order to direct wisely, in order to be a good leader, in order to have people follow him and be that leader among men, it says that he must learn to obey. By faithfulness in the little things, he was prepared for weightier trust. You know, friends, as I um, learned that I was going to be speaking on this today, it really spoke to my heart because this New Year's, I made a resolution that I was going to be faithful in the small things of life because it's easy to be faithful in the big things and then not worry about the small things sometimes. It's easy to put off doing things. It's easy to put off the small things sometimes. But I made this commitment that I'm going to be faithful in the small things this year. I want to be faithful. I want to hear God's calling in my life. I made a commitment that if I have to work in the cafeteria, and God knows I despise doing dishes. But if I get asked to do dishes, I'm going to do those dishes with all of my heart. I'm going to scrub the grease right out of all those pans, and I'm going to be faithful if I get asked to clean the bathroom in the dorm, which I have been, that's actually my job this semester, you know, I praise God for it. I'm going to do it with all of my heart. God is preparing for leaders, friends, and he wants you to be a leader. He wants me to be a leader. He wants leaders, friends. By being faithful in those small things of life, God can fit us for a greater responsibility. I want to read one more quote from this book, and it's found on page 61. And it says, paragraph 2, page 61, it says, the lesson is for all. So who's the lesson for? For you, for me, for all. None can know what may be God's purpose in his discipline, but all may be certain that faithfulness in little things is the evidence of fitness for greater responsibilities. Every act of life is a revelation of character. And he only, who is small, he, he only who in small duties proves himself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed will be honored by God with weightier trust. Friends, God is calling us to be faithful in the small things of life. He needs us to be faithful in the small things of life. God has a purpose for us. And Jesus, friends, is coming back again. He's coming, friends. And he wants us to be prepared. He wants us to be faithful in all the little duties of life, friends. Do you want to do that? Be faithful in life. Be faithful so you can hear God's calling. You know, it might be while you're scrubbing that toilet that you hear the voice of God calling you, giving your life calling, friends. Be faithful in the small things and let God speak to you, okay? Next point I want to make, verse 20. <clears throat> the Bible says, in verse 20, 
And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. He says, Let me go back and just say goodbye. Let me just say goodbye to my family. <clears throat> and he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done unto thee? You know, Elijah wasn't just rebuking Elisha right here, but he was asking him to make a decision and to count the cost, friends. Sometimes it calls for a separation in order to follow God. You know, Elijah's family was godly. That was a godly family. Sometimes what God calls us to separate from isn't necessarily always a bad thing. But when God calls you, friends, he does call for a separation sometimes. He calls us to separate ourselves from the world, separate ourselves from ungodly people. And why is that, you know? God calls us to separate from ungodly people. You know, the Bible says to come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Is it because we're better than them? No, it's not. It's because God loves them too. God has a greater purpose in mind. It's hard for us to understand that sometimes, friends. You know, God is calling us, friends, to separate ourselves from certain people sometimes. Separate ourselves from certain relationships. Maybe separate ourselves from certain family members. You know, I remember, I want to tell a story to you real quick um, that relates to this. That way we can know that God knows what's best. If God calls you to separate from somebody or something, it's because he knows what's best. God understands a lot more than we do. You know, I had this friend. You know, I'm very, sometimes I'm reluctant to tell some stories. But, um, you know, some of the things I've been through in my life, like I've learned some valuable spiritual lessons, valuable lessons that I would not trade for anything. And several years ago, um, I got into a relationship um, with a girl, and we were together for several years. And uh, we were living together, um, not living a Christian life, living a very sinful life. And I remember I used to tell her about the Bible, though, sometimes, too. I'd tell her about the truth that, I, that I'd known about, because I knew about the Adventist message, but I was, not living, I was struggling with a serious addiction. And um, I would tell this girl, though, all about the, the Bible sometimes, and this and that. And while we were living together, I was so convicted almost every single day to separate myself from her. But, you know, I was made to feel like that, that, that would not be the right thing to do. Because, like, she loved me, and I loved her. And it was like, how do I just leave her? Do you understand what I'm saying? I was made to believe that that was not the Christian thing to do. The devil is a deceiver, and he can really mess with our minds, friends. And um, one day I finally left. After, like, two years, I left. And um, we didn't talk or nothing for several weeks. And um, I remember she called me one night, and she was on drugs and stuff like that, too. And she was all distraught. And she said, what is, that, what is that church that you used to tell me about? I, I need to go. I need to go. And I was like, you mean the Seventh-day Adventist church? And she said, yes, yes. Where is it at? Where is it at? So I told her where the church was. And she started going to church. And uh, we eventually kind of made our way back together, which was not a good thing. And um, she would go to church. And I would go to church with her sometimes. And the whole time we were together again, I was so convicted to leave. That what, I, what I'm doing is wrong. But Lord, we're going to church. She's going to church. Can we not make it okay? God said, separate yourself from her. Man, I did not want to listen. And we were together for two more years. Slowly would stop going to church for a little while. Then we'd go back to church. And um, eventually, eventually, I finally listened. And I packed all my stuff up and I left. Completely severed contact completely severed contact with her. I knew that's what I had to do, and I felt so bad about it, though. But, you know, I believe that God had a reason for telling me to separate from this girl. And, you know, I looked her up on Facebook a while after I left her, and I saw that she got baptized in the Adventist church. And, you know, we haven't talked in two and a half years. When I look her up on Facebook today, it's amazing. She is a highly active member of the church today. She has her own ministry at the church called God's Closet, where she clothes children that have single mothers. Like it was so powerful. Like God told me to separate from her because he knew what was best for her. God loved her, friends. And you know, at least I'm telling you the story, friends, because I'm sure many of us maybe have some friends in our life that are, that are not godly friends. Maybe we have some acquaintance in our life that are not the best influence for, for us. But yeah, we want to be, be a good influence on them, right? 
That's how we justify it. Lord, I just want to be a good influence on them. You know, I believe that God is calling us to separate ourselves, to come out from the world, to be separate, because God loves us, He knows what's best, and He knows what's best for them. So if God calls you to separate, friends, it's for a reason. You know, as God told Elisha, or as Elijah told Elisha, to count the cost, to make a decision, make a decision to choose God, put God first, to trust me. God knows what he's saying, friends. Do you believe that? When God calls you to separate, friends, it's for a reason. And it's because he knows what is best. The last point, friends, and then we're going to be coming to a close shortly, is in verse 21. Verse 21. The Bible says, And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Do you understand what this is saying right here? This is really so powerful. You know, after, after he had wanted to go say goodbye to his family, and Elijah told me to count the cost, friends, and make, and make a decision. Elijah told him that. So Elisha took those oxen, friends, those oxen that he was plowing with, and, and, and sacrificed them, like completely burning that bridge, friends, and showing that he was not going back to his old life, completely severing that relationship, severing his ties to his old life, showing that he was going to follow God. Do you see that? He sacrificed those oxen that he's plowing with. You know, friends, Elisha completely severed that, that tie, friends. He burned that bridge down. You know, and we probably have bridges in our life, friends, that God is calling us to burn down. Bridges that might connect us to the world. Bridges that are connecting us to people that God does not want us connected with. Because God knows what's best, friends, and God is calling some of us to burn that bridge. Do you see that? Then maybe you have a bridge in your life, friends, that God is calling you to burn down, friends. You know, the whole point of this whole story, the whole point of everything that I'm trying to share with you, friends. It's because God wants to deliver us, friends. Jesus is coming back again, and he wants uh, wants to prepare us, prepare us for heaven. You know, there's little things in our life, friends, whether it's being faithful in the small things, or whether it's separating ourselves from certain people, whether it's turning our back on certain things, burning that bridge, whatever it is, it's because God wants to prepare us, prepare us for heaven, friends. And you know, as we learn all these things, learn all these different things about what God asked us to, asked us to do, burning those bridges, um, separating ourselves from the world, being faithful in the small things. You know, it sounds like easy, easy things that we can do. Like, we can do that. It sounds easy, doesn't it? He's just calling us to be faithful in the small things. I can do that. I can do that, Lord. I'll be faithful in the small things from here on out, friends. You know, but that you cannot do that. Did you know that? Like that you don't have any power in your life. None. You can't, you can't reform yourself. You can't change your own life, friends. Like it takes a power from God, a supernatural power, to give us the ability to be faithful in the small things of life, friends. Whatever God is calling you to do, friends, you have to have power from Jesus to do it. You know, I remember I used to get caught in the trap when I learned about Jesus in the Bible. And the Bible said, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's easy. I'll stop committing adultery. Thou shalt not kill. That's easy. I'll just stop hating people. I'll start loving people. I'll start doing all these things on my own, friends. You know, I found time and time again I failed miserably. I'll stop lying. I'll stop. I'll stop lying. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness. How hard is that? How hard is it for us to just stop lying, friends? You know, as I try to do all these things on my own, friends, I found I failed every time. We don't have power. We don't have power to do anything good on our own, friends. The Bible says in John 15, 5, that without me, ye can do nothing. You don't have power, friends, to do these things. But Jesus does. And you know, Jesus wants to give us that power, friends. He wants to give us power to be faithful in those small things. You know, as I was thinking about that iPhone, 
all those little screws and all those little connections that, that held the phone together, that, that phone would not power up without those little bitty small details and hook them together, friends. But you know those little screws and those little connections? You know, they did not, they did not connect themselves. You know, those screws did not just screw themselves in place. There was something greater than those screws that was putting that stuff together, friends. You know, and that's Jesus in our lives. To work on our hearts and change our lives. Change our hearts, friends. Give us a brand new life and a brand new heart. God does want us to be faithful in the small things, but he wants us to understand that we cannot do it on our own. So you say, then how can we do it then? Ask Jesus to help me? You know, friends, I'm going to tell you what, what it takes, friends. And this is, this is the truth. But it takes a complete, complete, complete surrender to God. If you don't make a complete surrender, friends, you're wasting your time and your walk with Christ. Wasting your life. Wasting your time. You see these little things you want to change, friends, and you decide, I'm going to change them. And then you stop them for a little while, and then how, how long does it go until you actually find yourself doing the same thing again, friends? Back in the same rut, struggling with the same thing, no matter what it is. Jesus needs a complete, complete surrender, friends. That's the only way he can work in you, idly, and give a brand new life. You know, in the, in the addiction world, people who are addicted to drugs, um, when they seek for professional help, when they want to make a decision to get clean and they go to rehab or they seek counsel, there is one thing that they are told immediately, almost throughout any recovery system, that if that heroin addict or that crack addict or that meth addict, whatever his addiction is, if he wants to get clean off that drug, friends, he has to give up every mind-altering substance he cannot hold on to nothing. There's so many addicts, friends, that want to get clean off heroin. They want to stop shooting up heroin. But they think they can still just smoke marijuana. They can still hold on to something small, drinking on the weekends. You know, it's almost 100% of the time, almost 100% of the time that any time an addict does that, that it's only a matter of time until they find themselves back at the drug of their choice. There's a book called Narcotics Anonymous, and it's full of so much truth, and that's actually one of the chapters in there. If the addict wants to get clean, he has to give up everything, friends. He has to give it all up. You know, it's the same thing with sinners, which we all are. You know, we all have this problem with sin, friends. And the only way that God can give us victory over sin, the only way, is if we give it all up. Like, give all of it up, everything. You know, there's nothing worth keeping you back from eternal life. There's nothing. You know, I remember I watched a sermon one time from Dwayne Lemon, and he was preaching against eggs and, and milk, and I was so convicted. I was like, well, maybe I should stop eating eggs and drinking milk. Um, but you know what? You know what helped me make my final decision? Whether or not eating eggs or meat or any of this thing is bad, if there's even a possibility, if there's even a possibility that me drinking milk is going to keep me from the kingdom of God, I don't care about that milk. I'm going to give it up. If there is even a slightest chance of any of these little things keeping you out of the kingdom, give them up. Nothing is worth losing eternal life, friends. Surrender all to Jesus. You know, God will give you a peace in your life, a peace that surpasses all understanding. I'm amazed when I look at what Jesus is doing in my own life. And, you know, I want to give you a chance this morning, friends. I want to make an appeal to you. You know, maybe, maybe there's many people here who have surrendered all, They've done it before, but they found themselves falling back in the same rut. Friends, I want to give you a chance to do it again, friends. Surrender your life to Jesus. Let Jesus give you a brand new life. Brand new life in Jesus. I want to appeal to those who have made that commitment to and anybody who hasn't. If you haven't ever given your whole heart to Jesus, friends, man, do it now. Jesus is coming, friends, and he wants to prepare us for heaven. Do you believe that? He's coming, friends, and I pray that you will let God speak to her. So I want to make that appeal to you, friends. I want to ask those who want to make that commitment. And you know, I want to say this too real quick. Because uh, I'm calling for people that want to surrender their lives to Jesus. Make a commitment to Jesus to serve him faithfully with all of your heart, friends. I want to ask those people to stand up, friends. Those that want to do that, live for Jesus. Let him give you a brand new life, a brand new heart, friends. 
You know, this week, man, the Lord is going to be speaking to us all throughout the week, giving us opportunities to grow closer to Him. Don't let the week of prayer pass you by and not be blessed by it. So let's pray, okay? Um, Father, we, Lord, we just want to thank you, Father. Um, Lord, we know that we are unworthy, Lord, to be called your children. And we know that you love us so much, Father. We know that you want to give us that power from heaven, Lord, to overcome, Lord, all the things in our life, Lord. And I pray that as we learn today, Father, um, that faithfulness in small things will prepare us for the weight of your trust that you want to give us, friend. And Father, as we learn that sometimes you call us to separate ourselves um, from people or friends, um, that is you, it's because you have their greater good in mind, Lord. And Father, just as, you, just as Elisha was willing to burn that bridge and turn his back on his old life, Father, I pray that we could do that today. I pray, Father, that you bless us this week of prayer and that day by day you'd speak to us and help us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.